Hello, thank you for joining this talk. Um, my name is Chris Van Hees. Um, I work for Oracle in the Language and Tools Department uh, for Linux Engineering. And I'm going to be talking about D-Trace, specifically D-Trace on Linux. And um, the main focus is the new development that we're currently doing, which is leveraging the power of BPF and other kernel features that um, are for tracing. So to give a little overview of um, the presentation, I'm going to start with a very short history of D-Trace on Linux. Um, primarily because from previous experiences, we found that people are not really aware of how long D-Trace has existed on Linux. And so we're gonna put a little bit of a historical context here. Then I will be giving a short overview of D-Trace on Linux, the overall design um, that is primarily focusing on the existing version or the older version, I would say. Um, and then we can work towards um, the new development, which is D-Trace based on BPF and other tracing facilities. I will be highlighting um, some of the work that has gone into that, how we're approaching that implementation, and some of the, the different needs that we found. Um, then we go into the implementation details, um, not getting to you know, all details of it because it's, that would be a very lengthy talk, but definitely want to highlight some things that are um, really special in, in how we're doing this. And then I will move into lessons learned, and I probably will be speaking about those throughout the presentation, uh, some things we found as we were doing this work, um, but I want to highlight some that really stood out um, and can also help uh, people who are um, like us are working with D-Trace and or with BPF primarily. And then finally, I want to highlight some limitations we have found and um, some unsolved mysteries, some unsolved problems that you know we're still working on, and it remains to be seen whether those will be things that um, we may have to submit a kernel patch for or we find other workarounds. So moving forward to just looking at D-Trace on Linux for a moment, um, as historically speaking. So originally the project started in 2010 and um, it, it really started with our management essentially asking us to explore the possibility of bringing D-Trace to Linux. And I was given the uh, task to do this exploratory work and I came back with the decision from my side or recommendation that I didn't think this was feasible. And then two weeks later, we were told um, we have to do it anyway. So we had to figure out, you know, how this can be done. So we initially were able to release the first version in 2011 uh, based on Linux 2.6 kernels. And it was a challenge because there were um, quite some features that we wanted to implement um, for which we didn't have the support in the kernel. So Development continued on from there, alongside with obviously newer Linux kernels being released. And so, you know, as I'm showing the slide through, you know, the time period from 2013, 15, 18, 19, um, we have progressively been um, active in, in developing D-Trace. And at this point, the implementation that is available, um, and, you know, we have been backporting the patches and forward porting both. So um, we make patch tests available for these versions, of what we call the legacy version of D-Trace on Linux, um, even to the most recent kernels that are being released. So we're, we want to keep supporting that effort uh, for people to be able to use D-Trace. Now in 2018, we kind of sat together as a team and determined that the, the use of a very invasive kernel patch you know, to implement D-Trace was uh, suboptimal because a lot of people don't want to, you know, in, uh, apply large patch sets to the kernel in order to have a feature like that. Um, and so we started looking towards whether we can do this using existing features in the kernel and redesign the user space component so that D-Trace itself would be just a user space. And so we've been working that since 2018. And so this year we were able to release um, a new version of D-Trace on Linux, which is based on BPF and other Linux kernel tracing facilities. Um, it currently still requires um, a few patches to be applied to the kernel, but they're not specific to D-Trace. Um, and they're definitely not invasive. So we'll get to that. So looking at D-Trace as a whole, and this is before the, the whole redesign based on BPF, 
Um, it is built around two big components. One is the kernel space producer, one is the user space consumer. So all the tracing data is being generated at the kernel level and user space consumer is just taking the data out of buffers and representing them. Um, it also has a component in terms of um, loading the tracing programs into the kernel, um, compiling them. But that's you know, all done completely at the user space level. The actual tracing work is being done in the kernel and that involves um, some kernel support functions, very core kernel support that we have had to add to be able to facilitate various features that D-Trace has. Uh, we added probes to the kernel that are very specific to D-Trace. And um, uh, there's a set of kernel modules that then implement uh, the bulk of the producer code. And the only reason why I mentioned this slide here, uh, a rough count of how many lines of code those components um, comprise, is really to kind of give that sense that it's about split 50-50. And the reason is that although the kernel does the most of the work, the consumer contains the compiler and that just, you know, consumes the bulk of the code. So, but it still shows that, you know, we had quite a task ahead of us if we wanted to essentially get rid of a kernel component. So this is um, a bit of an overview slide that kind of I've, I've been using for years, pretty much from the beginning when I started this work, that tells you what all sits in D-Trace. Um, and that is based on the original design. So we have the user space component on the top, which is well, in user space, obviously, and that has some of the trace buffer management. And then everything else is the kernel. You know, there is the execution engine, there are helper functions, um, there is a processor that handles probe actions. And so in a way, there is a, both an activity going from top to bottom and from bottom to top. So when you start tracing, obviously you invoke a command on user space and information is being sent down to the kernel. Once tracing starts, all tracing is based on probes that fire at some part in the kernel. And so there they initiate execution. So a probe fires, then there is a provider that handles uh, a set of probes that have the same characteristics and they all funnel into this probe action processor, which is a single function uh, in the kernel module for D-Trace that kind of unifies uh, probes as a genetic probe and then handles the execution uh, in the div execution engine and writes uh, buffer data to the buffer. So that's kind of the, the overview and largely that same design is still present in the current version with based on BPF and kernel fa tracing facilities, but it's no longer D-Trace code. And so some, some functions have changed there. So looking towards um, doing D-Trace on BPF and some other tracing facilities, what we found, and this was in 2018 when we started exploring this, is really that a lot of the features that exist in the, in the kernel for tracing have matured a lot. And I, I don't want to imply that when they were designed, they were kind of, you know, unstable or not, you know, not, not mature in their design, but a lot of them did not work together as well. Um, there was not that much unity between the different implementations. Uh, now we have K probes, U probes, trace points, um, and raw perv events, and they can all be made available as perv events. So you have a single interface that gets its access to all of these. And there are different mechanisms of how you enable them. But ultimately, you can treat them kind of in a more genetic way, which was one of the underlying uh, needs we had. And the fact that it's already in the kernel means we didn't have to add code for that. Um, BPF exists as an internal execution engine. Now it's there can be debate on whether it's supposed to be interpreted as a very generic execution engine for pretty much anything or whether it's um, more for a specific purpose. But for us, it did what we need to do. It can be used um, to execute BPF programs that are attached to perv events, which is great because we have a probe that fires. It executes a BPF program. It can create data and write it to a perv event ring buffer, and then we can pull it out of there user space. So it kind of does what we need to be done. And so that whole portion in the previous slide that is kernel level more or less exists in the, the standard kernel anyway. So we can make use of that. And so 
the very important part behind the whole design is that we are providing D-trace. You know, we're not providing some kind of a tracing wrapper around BPF. Um, so the core of all the functionality, the core of what defines, you know, what we are offering in terms of functionality for tracing is D-trace. D-trace added is documented, D-trace the way people know it. And so that was a very big underlying concept that we can't change how D-trace works. So we're using BPF. BPF is not what is um, ultimately the center point of how tracing is going to be. And that's an important distinction to make because uh, we want to make it important that people who are familiar with D-trace can expect that it's still going to work uh, the way they're used to. So very quickly on the design philosophy, and um, I used to have a more entertaining slide for this, but I, I, I found it kind of takes away from uh, what is really important. The big assumption we made starting out with this was that we can do everything in user space. And that was after we did a few false starts with trying to get features into the kernel that we knew we were going to need. And we were correctly um, put in our place about the fact that it's not the way we should be going about things. You know, we should first establish that there is a real need. We should, so basically we should first try it another way. Uh, and that's, you know, what we're going to do. We're going to assume we can do everything in user space. And then we'll see where that goes. The second assumption was that we assume there's no impact on performance or stability. Now that's, this is the point where in, in previous talks, um, I kind of pointed out the fact that, you know, you look at those two assumptions and you start crying because there's no way this is going to work. Um, but, you know, we're, we were trying to be overly positive, positive about it so that we can kind of evaluate how things are going to go. So we take those assumptions, how crazy they may be, and so we start the re-implementation of the tracing user space, you know, reusing as much of the code as we can um, because it helps us guarantee um, the functionality is the same, but making sure that, you know, we work with new features. Then we perform accuracy tests. You know, it needs to work the way D-Trace is supposed to work. Uh, stability, obviously, can't impact the system. You know, tracing should be as non-invasive as possible. And then performance tests, again, you know, run, doing tracing always is going to affect the system somehow, um, but it should be minimal to the extent we can. So then we evaluate the findings. That is where, you know, we start kind of weeping because there's no way, you know, you're not going to see some effect from the fact that we're doing the implementation differently. So that's where we have to evaluate, adjust our implementation, go back and, and just reiterate the same process over and over again, trying to perfect uh, the implementation. If eventually we find that with throwing everything at it that we can come up with, we cannot maintain accuracy, stability and performance, then we get to the point of needing to look outside of this just user space aspect and evaluate whether there are some improvements we can recommend for the kernel implementation of some features, or maybe uh, make recommendations for additional features to be added to the kernel that would be for the benefit of any tracer that basically uses BPF and some of the other kernel facilities. So the goal was really to be able to, at a minimum, collect enough information that we can make a well-reasoned case with evidence that you know, there are limitations that we hope to be able to resolve at the kernel level. So that, that's really at the, when all else fails at this point. So looking towards the implementation uh, details, so BPF and D-Trace are very different things and I shouldn't have a slide comparing them because they do, they do different things. You know, BPF runs code in um, a virtual sense. It's, it's an execution engine and D-Trace is a tracing tool. The reason why I'm comparing these two is that there are some underlying assumptions that exist, especially for where BPF is used for tracing, that is quite different from what D-Trace expects, and that has been kind of one of our biggest pain points. So in BPF, you have a variety of program types, and if a program is of a certain type, then some functionality can be used and other functionality cannot be used. So that's very important because if probes can have different program types, I can't write one program 
then expect it to work for different types of probes, which is something in d we can do. Um, on top of that, because of it, each probe type having its own program type, it also has its own BPF context it runs with. That is the kind of information that is given to the BPF program when it starts execution. And that differs depending on probe type. So I don't have a generic um, abstract context, so to speak, that represents all the probe types. And that's an issue because again, D-Trace expects uh, something different there. And you can only attach one BPF program per probe. Now that's not exactly correct. Uh, there are ways you could get around that. Uh, none of those are pretty. And there is still a limitation of how many there can be. Um, and that is a hard limit, no matter what. So whatever tricks you use, you're still going to hit limits there. Now on the D-Trace side, we work with a single generic program type. All D programs, D is the language in which they are written as a higher level language. It's one type, it's one type program. Um, we only have one generic concept of what the probe context is and all the probes somehow uh, figure into that. And that's why we have the providers. Um, when I show the slide with the overview, you have providers that group probes kind of together by type, but they expose a generic probe context that is the same for all of them, it just they might fill in different information. And again, we can have many clauses uh, per probe and a single class can be attached to different probe types. So there's a bit of a incompatibility here, so to speak, between the two. So if we look at uh, more deeper into the implementation details, look at a D class, which is simply saying, I have a probe or multiple probes, maybe specify, and I'm attaching some code to that. Essentially that code will be executed when the, one of those probes fires. And that can be a probe of different types or whichever. So what we do is we take the D class and we generate a BPF function. And you know, I put the function product up there. Actually, it's, it gets that uh, DTDCTX context, that's the DTrace context. That is what it's been passed to. Now, at this moment, when this code is being generated, we're presuming we only have one program type, we only have one probe uh, context. How we go from probe on the BPF level, with different contexts to this, uh, I'll address in the next slide. But so when the actual tracing code is compiled, we are compiling it as if it's generic, with no knowledge whatsoever about the probe. Um, so it operates on a generic probe context, and it can be used for multiple probes across multiple types. So we compile this class once, and then it can be part of a uh, a BPF program for any variety of and any number of probes. So where that works is that once we have these functions and we're ready to attach programs to probes, um, we generate a BPF trampling program. That is the actual BPF program that we're going to be loading into the kernel. And that one is specific to us with a certain program type and accepts a specific BPF context for that program type. So it sets up the generic probe context based on that information. It's kind of doing the work that we, in the past the providers would do. And then it calls each class function, every class in turn, passing that generic context. So this is where we have moved from doing things the BPF way to now doing things the D-trace way. And so all these class functions are written in that generic sense and do whatever manipulation they need to do but it's without having, again, knowledge of what the original uh, program context was. And then we perform any necessary cleanup so that after the program uh, finishes, um, we're back in a clean state. And I should have mentioned on the previous slide, every class function is the same way. Every class function is written as if it is the only class function. It gets past the probe context, it runs, and at the end of it, we should be back in the same state as when we originally got called except for some data was generated that was put in a buffer. And so we can have any number of clauses called one after the other, and they don't affect each other, except in cases where the code is specifically written for that by the use of you know, global variables, uh, thread local storage variables, things like that. So before this, you know, this whole rewrites uh, or redesign started, 
the unit of compilation, and here I'm comparing D-trace before and D-trace now, so just to, to put that in context. Uh, the unit of compilation was an action, and that's not the easiest thing to, to describe. So a class might contain multiple actions. Actions are usually things that generate um, some kind of data. So let's say if I have a write system call that I'm tracing, I could write out each of the arguments that was passed to the system call. If I do them independently, each of those data items is its own action. If I do it, let's say, as a printf, and I include all of them in there, that printf is one action. So it's, when looking at a class, it's not that easy to really see the boundaries between the different actions, but that is what actually happens. The compiler um, is breaking up the classes into actions. Each action is being compiled independently. It generates diff code, which is just the intermediate format code. It's a bytecode. And they get loaded into the kernel. And so it is loaded together with some metadata that essentially associates a set of actions with a particular class, and then that with a particular probe. So we're dealing with different units. And so when a probe fires, a sequence of actions is being executed one after the other, not a series of clauses, but the effect is the same. And so there is a kernel component that provides variable management, like I said, the global variables, local variables, uh, PLS variables, all that stuff, and some support functions. Now in the current worlds where we no longer have um, this larger components in the kernel, specifically for D-Trace, the unit of compilation is actual class. So the whole class gets compiled into a BPF function. Obviously we generate BPF code, and because we have all these classes, we compile once and then use for different probes, and they might be of different probe types, we actually have to introduce a linker, which takes the uh, generated trampoline program, which is written in BPF, which has function calls in there and relocation records that tells us which functions need to be um, linked in. And so we have a, a linked process that pulls in all the BPF functions that are necessary for this particular program um, because the BPF program has to be self-contained right now. And so it links it all together and that gets loaded into the kernel. So where before we're doing individual actions, we are now actually loading multiple clauses in one single program. And that is done per probe. And then of course, variable management and support functions has to now be implemented in BPF code itself. And that is in part done by code that is generated in line by the compiler whenever we, you know, we're making use of a variable, um, which means we have to do some memory management as well. And it also uses BPF functions. So actual code that is written in C that is compiled into BPF codes um, ahead of time. And the linker pulls those in and links them into the BPF program to accomplish you know, the functionality we need. So that brings us to the lessons we've learned in this whole um, endeavor. And that's been quite a bit. Um, the BPF verifier, and I'm, I'm bluntly honest by referring to it as your enemy and your friend. And I'll go for the friendly part first. Whenever you load a BPF program into the kernel, it is um, analyzed by the BPF verifier in the kernel and it will reject your program if there is any unsafe operation in there. And it, it's picky. You know, it, it really is the kind of the, the guard against unsafe BPF programs being executed in the kernel. So it is your enemy in the sense that the least unsafe operation you do that in your mind should be okay because you know what you're doing. The BPF verifier is gonna say no. So if I, for instance, know that a register has never been used, or um, even better, if, if I know that because of the implementation of BPF, a register is initialized at zero, that doesn't mean I can just start adding to it. I do an add operation because I would involve reading the value, adding to it and writing it back. And the verifier will say, well, well, you never wrote 
any value or ever stored any value to this register. So I'm not going to let you read from it. So it's taken a while to implement the decompiler to generate BPF codes, um, to generate code that the BPF verifier would accept. Because I would keep finding these things that I thought were safe and the BPF fire verifier reminded me that actually it's not. Because it might be safe right now, but down the road it might not. And so I had to uh, tweak things. So it's very important that it exists, but it, it can be a little painful to work with. The output from the verifier is also quite obscure. I mean, it's, it tells you all the different instructions in the program, you know, if it fails the load, and it tells you where it fails, but the syntax is not familiar to what you typically would get, for instance, with uh, a disassembler. Uh, fortunately, D-Trace has its own disassembler. So we uh, changed the disassembler to generate BPF instructions, obviously, since that's what we're compiling to. And you can tell D-Trace to give you a disassembly dump of the compiled functions or the completely final linked program right before it gets loaded into the kernel. So that I can help with finding out where things go wrong. And hopefully um, we do a good enough job in uh, testing the compiler that's in general use, you're not going to run into uh, issues. The decode should be at all times compiled into valid BPF code. Um, we found that the LLVM and the Clang based BPF compiler has some peculiarities. Like for instance, you must compile with optimization, optimization level two, uh, which is not necessarily an issue, but we found that as we were writing some of the support functions that we want linked in, um, LLVM and CLang was too specific in what it expected and the kind of um, object code it generated. So fortunately, another team um, at Oracle has added BPF support to GCC and to binutils. And so we can now just compile our um, C code into BPF using GCC, use binutils to uh, generate a nice alpha object that we can use as a library to link code from. So um, we worked around that, um, that problem of LVM being more specific and being able to now use a more uh, generic compiler has been a great benefit. And then finally, we find out, and of course we knew this from the beginning, but it's, it's, it's always a good thing to still highlight it, that when you're making use of existing features, you're impacted by the limitations. And I'm, I'm not saying this to highlight that somehow the tracing facilities in the kernel have um, limitations. I mean, everything has limitations and it's not a perfect fit. And that is what I would like to highlight here primarily. Um, we are still running into cases where certain fa tracing facility features were implemented with a specific need. And so that need might not match completely what D-Trace um, is expecting. And we need to work out whether we can work around that by using them in a different way or using different features, or whether, you know, yes, we have to um, open a communication with kernel developers on what we can do about these limitations, uh, especially because our use cases may um, resemble other use cases that either already exist or may pop up with other tracing tools. And so it can be to everybody's benefits to be able to work around some of these limitations. So that's always a, you know, a very important thing that we keep in mind um, that we need to work on. So going to the limitations and unsolved mysteries section. Um, one thing, and this has come up at uh, all the conferences where we have, where we have either attended or presented um, on DTRIS and using BPF, is that there is a desire for many people to have BPF code sharing at the kernel level. Uh, what I mean is being able to have certain BPF functions being loaded into the kernel as almost a library and preferably something you can do almost dynamic link library support. Because like for instance, all the support functions we have in D-Trace to handle uh, global variables to help DLS variables, uh, string, fun string functionality, things like that. 
are going to be used by all these different BPF programs attached to their individual probes. And right now, they have to be statically linked into the BPF program for every single of those probes. And when you start tracing a very large amount of probes, you know, the, the bloat of these extra codes can become significant. So that is definitely something that is missing right now. It's a limitation um, that hopefully a solution will be found for. And I know people have been working towards that. So we look forward to that. And we definitely want to also look towards being able to contribute to that effort uh, because, you know, it's definitely also to our benefit. Uh, we found, and this is an embarrassing one for me personally, because um, I kind of thought that there was a signed divide and modulo instruction in BPF, and well, there isn't, uh, which is not that big of a deal. We had to work around. Um, but it's it highlighted, and the reason why I put it in as an example, it highlights that there have been certain assumptions made in the past, and I still probably do that on a daily or weekly basis, that I would expect something to be there, but it's just not. And that is not criticism of BPF, it's just you know, BPF was designed the way it was, and we have needs that we have, and you know, it would be nice if any processor, that if, if you write code, would have the instructions that you want, but you, know, you need to work with the instruction set that's available. So um, it's one of those things we need to be aware of and uh, make sure that we can have implementations for this function, uh, these instructions as functions that is, you know, as lightweight as possible. You know, likewise, memory and string functions do not exist. There is very, there's some limited support to helpers that can help with, that, that can work with this, but um, in tracing facilities, tracing tools, uh, we are going to be working with strings. We're going to work with memory blocks. You know, we might want to know what is the file name passed to an open syscall. So we need to be able to, you know, copy that. We might want to strip off any path elements and just have the base file name. Um, we might want to copy a memory block. You know, if we're tracing, for instance, um, network functionality, uh, can we copy part of the packet data into an output buffer? You know, these are all things that we need to figure out how to best do that um, within the within the limitations that BPF presents and those limitations that are there for a reason. Um, which brings us to the next one. There are no loops in BPF right now. And I have to also add that there are no loops in D-trace. So in a way that is not a limitation, but loops would be very convenient to implement things like string functions. You know, since we don't have, for instance, a function that might say to look for a character in a string, well, with a loop that would be very easy to implement. Well, we can't. So we can work around that. We can do loop and rolling uh, implementations like that, but loops would be very useful. And looking towards the future, by using BPF, Dtrace actually is able to implement some features that we couldn't do before. And uh, like, for instance, conditional statements in a class are not possible right now in D, but it's something that would be great to add. And BPF obviously allows that because it supports conditionals. Now, with BPF, at some point, might um, provide support for loops. That would be a very big, uh, nice to have uh, as a feature to add to the D language as well for D-Trace. So there is definitely some connection point there. Then standard D-Trace SDT probes. Um, that is a work in progress because there are obviously a significant amount of probes already available in uh, the Linux kernel. There is various trace points. And D-Trace has for very many years pretty much from the very beginning established a standard set of statically defined tracing probes in a kernel. And the various implementations on different operating systems have provided those. And so it would be ideal if we can provide those still in a version that is based on BPF, which means we're going to have to do a combination of using what is there right now for trace some points and even have some code that can uh, um, changes them. Not, not in the implementation of the kernel, but have some BPF code that will present them 
to the Dietrich clauses as their equivalent SDT probes. And that can be done. And that is just a matter of just of generating that generic probe context. Now, there are going to be some cases, and we have identified a few of those, where there is no equivalent probe currently in the kernel. And so we will be evaluating, have been evaluating which ones um, would need to be added in order to be able to satisfy this set of standard SDT probes. And that will be something that you know, we will be in communication with uh, the kernel development community and tracing community to see you know, what is the best way to move forward with that. Uh, implementation of dynamic variables and associative arrays is also something that is currently an, an unsolved uh, topic, mainly because it's, it involves some kind of memory management that needs to be done. And before there was support for that uh, in the DTX kernel module, now we have to implement it somehow in BPF. And so that is still a bit of an unknown um, issue and with lots of question marks on how can we do this and how can we do this in an efficient manner. And that's, that's always, you know, one of the underlying principles that, you know, performance needs to be uh, limited. I'm uh, sorry, impact performance <laughs> needs to be limited. Um, the error probe, that is a probe that fires in D-trace when something goes wrong in the execution of probes. Um, that one is currently not implemented yet because there is no way to trigger it because it would actually mean that we should be able to trigger a probe firing from within BPF code. Um, and that obviously is a bit of an issue because um, you know, you're dealing with uh, re-entrance of um, the BPF execution engine, and that's, that's a whole other thing that we don't want to get into. So we're looking at different ways to implement that, to still have the functionality D-Trace requires, um, but within, again, the context of BPF and what it provides. And like one of the really unsolved mysteries here is that the error probe typically will tell you which instruction caused the error. Now, there is no access to a program counter within a BPF program. You can't see which instruction you're executing. Or at least, yeah, you can't access that like from a register. So we're still working on different scenarios on how we can resolve this or uh, for lack of better terms, you fake it, that we get the correct information. Uh, but again, we, within the, the context of what is being provided by BPF. And then scalability, you know, that's the one that right now we've kind of put a little bit on the back burner because in, obviously accuracy of the implementation is more important and stability is more important but performance versus scalability is where um, there is still a lot of unknowns. And for instance, a lot of other tracing tools will trace some probes. Now we have been working with use cases where we're craving thousands of probes. And then suddenly uh, the impact of, for instance, a BPF program taking uh, a full page of memory in the kernel that needs to be locked or um, the BPF maps that store data being done in chunks of whole pages can really start hurting you on the system, especially if you know you run with uh, a system that has, for instance, 64 kilobyte pages instead of four kilobyte pages. So this is something that still we need to explore and it's going to be where we're putting the tracing facilities in the kernel really to the test of um, can it support this more massive level of um, onslaught of probing without impacting the system um, that tremendously. So where can you find this? Um, the source code lives on GitHub. Um, it's uh, in our Details Utils uh, repository. And specifically, it is the 2.0 branch-dev tree. And I need to highlight that. And this is, this has occurred because of how our development uh, took place. Uh, we also have a 2.0 branch tree, which is the one from which our internal releases are built from. So the actual active development is on the branch that is on this slide. And that is where you know, everything is being pushed 
after um, you know, patches have been reviewed, have been accepted. So that, that is all development happens there, the 2.0 branch three um, is, I guess, the stable released code, which is usually less interesting because it's going to be several weeks behind uh, the development branch. But so if you want to check out what we're doing, this branch specifically um, <clears throat> will give you everything you want to see. And um, that has always been tested before things obviously go on there, but that doesn't mean it's guaranteed to you know, be stable. It's, it's pre-release, obviously. And then we also have a mailing list, uh, d2isdevil at oss.oracle.com, which is for any discussion of D3s. Right now, um, I would say 99% of the traffic uh, is discussing the version of DTRIS on Linux based on BPF and other kernel tracing facilities uh, with occasionally something popping up about the, what I would call the legacy version based on the more invasive kernel patch. And you know, patches are posted to this and this is where you know, we would welcome any uh, dialogue about uh, DTRIS and its further, further development because the, the goal really is here to do this in a way where can, we can make DTRAs available to the wider community, both as a tool, but also to welcome um, people's input and uh, any contributions uh, towards making DTRAs better and you know, bring all the power that it has in, in full to Linux because the current version, obviously, because it's, it's still in active development of the redesign, you know, still poses limitations and, you know, that is to be expected. Uh, we want to, as much as we can, build up from that and, and do additional development. So I would very much encourage anyone to um, check out the code. Um, there is information in the branch uh, concerning some kernel patches that are required right now uh, for the best operation. Um, to highlight them, it is providing CTF information, which is basically type information from the kernel um, so that you actually can, you know, access data types that exist in the kernel. You can get access to um, addresses based on symbolic information. So that information is there. There is inf uh, a patch that makes it possible to um, be waiting on tasks, be able to um, supports the user space tracing, although the, the actual tracing portions of that are currently still in the development. And then there is a very small patch to um, okay, all sims, what essentially associates kernel symbols with their specific modules they exist in, whether the module is compiled in the kernel or not, which just makes it easier to uh, organize the probes. So all that is in there, it gives you instructions on how to build this. Um, it should build on pretty much any um, nature distribution right now. Um, there are some dependencies, again, they are mentioned um, in the tree. And we also, in that sense, would welcome uh, any reports on our mailing list um, of issues that are found trying to uh, compile this on a particular distribution, because the goal really is that this should be a user space tool for tracing that, you know, is not tied to a specific distribution. So we definitely welcome anything there uh, in terms of contributions. So I very much appreciate um, your attention uh, during this talk. Um, I always find it strange doing these talks uh, virtual. Uh, I always like the interaction we have with the uh, with audience um, at presentations, but I hope um, this gave a bit of an overview of the work that has been done on DTrace. Again, this is still very active development and um, we hope that we are able to find some solutions for the um, outstanding problems that still exist and that all those will be, you know, a benefit to the overall tracing community because this is the underlying goal by able to use the tracing facilities that exist in the kernel. We want to become one of the tracing tools that make use of that and that therefore uh, can provide use cases, can provide um, a way to exercise the facilities and highlight areas where further development can take place, improvements can be made. And so we can all work together, be it on the kernel side, be it on the tracing tool sides, 
um, towards improving the ability to trace um, the Linux operating system, both in the kernel and in user space. So I thank you for your attention.